I think we'll get started here this afternoon. I want to welcome you to uh, ITIF event on uh, the promise of autonomous vehicles. Uh, I'm Rob Atkinson, I'm president of ITIF, and uh, we've got a really fantastic panel here today. I'm going to introduce folks just very briefly. I'll make a few opening comments. We'll go down the line and hear from folks. Uh, we should have plenty of, plenty of time for questions. Or, Chris, Chris Umson, Urmson, who is the leader of Google's self-driving program. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Google's self-driving vehicles really need no introduction. They've driven over 400,000 miles on California roads. Uh, Chris was the director of technology for the team that won the 2007 DARPA Urban Challenge Award. Uh, he also earned his PhD from uh, CMU uh, in uh, computer science. Uh, in, in 2005. Uh, Jason Schultz is the partnership manager of Toyota Motor Sales uh, and uh, in the 21st century business strategy for business partnerships group. Uh, his responsibility is to lead the team to research, identify, and leverage new technologies and companies to uniquely develop automotive products for the 21st century. You know, I, um, the neighbor of mine just bought a new car. It wasn't a Toyota, I'm sorry to say. But, um, Someday it will be. And I was comparing it to my car, which I think is a pretty cool car, the 2006 car. Uh, and what I realized is my car is just terrible compared to his car, because cars used to be this thing where, you know, they would change every year because the tail fins would get a little bigger or a little smaller. Uh, now cars are like computers. Uh, you want a new car because the IT system in the car is so much better than the IT system three years ago. So now I feel like i got to buy a new car just to keep up with, uh, with with all the advanced IT. So that's really, I think, what, in a lot of ways, what automotive is moving towards. Automotive is, if you will, becoming an IT industry. Uh, and that's really a lot of what Jason uh, Jason is focusing on there. Uh, he's been responsible for bringing to market uh, several award-winning telematics products, including Safety Connect, Lexus Inform, Lexus Inform Map Suite, and Toyota and Tune. He's also received awards from CNET and Tech Radar for his work at the uh, Consumer Electronics Show. Uh, and has also received the Tele Award for his launch work at the Toyota and Tune. Uh, to my immediate right is Bill Krennick, who is the Chief Technologist for High Volume Linear Products at Texas Instruments. And uh, Bill and I spoke uh, about it must have been four years ago now. And uh, Bill was an early on enthusiast of what these technologies could do because both Bill and TI are one of the, are one of the major developers of the. You know, Bill will sure tell you more about it, but you know you can't build an autonomous car if you have great electronics. You need great software too. You need great electronics. And Bill had a vision early, early on that the electronics world making this really possible. I remember we talked four years ago, and I was like, "Wow, are you sure that'll work? That sounds really, really futuristic." Uh, and that future is here, uh, as, as we will hear today. Um, so high volume linear products include analog, digital, and power electronics for a wide range of consumer end products. Uh, over his 28 year career in the semiconductor industry, Bill has held technical and management roles for a variety of end applications, including medical products, wireless, uh, data storage, and uh, for this case, automotive products. Uh, he's received his doctorate in electrical engineering from UT Dallas in 93, uh, and is the holder of over uh, 50 US patents. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Mary Che, who is the council member of the D.C. City Council. Uh, uh, she has served on uh, the council since 2007 and is currently, uh, in, in most relevant for this context, chair of the Committee on Transportation and Environment. Uh, she's an attorney by trade and has uh, really championed a wide range of legislation in the district uh, to make our lives better if we either live or work in the district including, I, I think everyone can relate to this, uh, perhaps the most important one was the Taxi Cab Service Improvement Act. Uh, <laughs> that was just in Europe, uh, in London, I'm marveling at boy, what, how nice the cabs are and how friendly the drivers were. And I was like, couldn't we get them to take over with you, CC cabs? <laughs> CC cabs are a lot better now, and uh, partly from our leadership on that. And, and then, uh, obviously, most relevant uh, to today, um, Congresswoman was the, um, the councilwoman, uh, excuse me, was uh, the lead author of the Autonomous Vehicle Act of 2012, uh, which allows autonomous vehicles to operate on uh, the district roadway. So we'll get into a little bit about the legal uh, and, and regulatory uh, opportunities and challenges in, in just a few minutes. 
So let me just make a couple of quick uh, observations here uh, just to get us started. You know, again, we think about this as like, well, driving is this thing that there's no way we can, we can sort of get the human out of the system. And I remember a few years ago uh, taking an airplane uh, ride and uh, we land the plane and the pilot gets on the, the, uh, the PA and he says, by the way, um, we didn't land that plane. Uh, the pilot, uh, the co my co-pilot and I didn't do anything to land that plane. We let that plane land completely by machine. Uh, so completely automated landing. Uh, already on the ground. <laughs> well, he, we were, he told us that when we were on the ground. If he said that in the middle of it, you would have seen a scene from Airplane. And, you know, it's like, are you kidding? Get your hands on the wheel. Um, but, you know, planes can do that. Uh, and, and cars eventually uh, can do that now, but eventually we'll be able to do that much more easily. Why is that important? Because human error is the cause of 93% of traffic accidents today. Human error. Uh, you know, you, you can see that. People texting, people drunk, people tired, people stupid. Uh, <laughs> lots of people who are just bad drivers. Uh, we see that every day. Uh, and uh, if you think about replacing that human error function with a machine that doesn't really make errors, uh, you can ameliorate the 35,000 traffic fatalities we have every, day, every year, 100 a day, uh, and the $450 billion in losses reason we pay insurance bills the way we pay them because there's a lot of accidents. Uh, the other thing we could do is we could really dramatically improve the efficiency of our transportation system. I chaired a national commission on highway and transit financing that Congress created a commission for authorized it and it was striking to us how bad our service transportation system is. We just underinvested it and the odds of that getting fixed are not any not good anytime soon. We're not willing to put the money into it. <coughs> But if you could get cars that instead of driving 50 feet from each other in rush hour traffic, drive six feet from each other or two feet from each other, you could compress many, many more cars into the throughput on each mile of the urban freeway. Uh, and you, the studies have shown that with autonomous vehicles, uh, you could increase roadway utilization two to three times. So think about it, that would be equivalent to expanding the beltway from eight lanes to 24 lanes without having to put a single piece of concrete down. Uh, and right now, uh, some studies show that highways at peak capacity are only 6% occupied by cars. So a real, real, real benefit here of being able to fix one of these problems. Um, we could also increase uh, mobility. If you think about one of the biggest problems that older people face, as they get older, uh, they, they lose the ability to drive effectively. I mean, that's happened to a relative of mine recently. Um, we got in a little bit of a fender bender, she's in her 80s, and just simply just, look, you can't drive a car anymore, it's just not safe enough. And so her mobility is quite constrained. Now, if there were autonomous vehicles again, that would, again, open up mobility. So for a whole lot of our populations, this, is a, this could be a huge opportunity. Uh, and imagine a new business model where if any of you ever use Zipcar, uh, you know, you got to go find and learn a Zipcar thing. Imagine a future where I say, you know what, I want a Zipcar. I press a little button and out in front of Rayburn is a zip car waiting for me. You know, at some point that's going to happen. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I think at some point that will happen. Uh, and, and so there's really an amazing uh, set of opportunities here. They're not going to happen tomorrow, but they're going to happen. And I think it's important for us, uh, really as policy, you as policymakers, understand what those are and think about what are the implications of how do we, how do we move that forward. So I think uh, we'll start uh, with uh, Jason. Uh, thanks, Rob. Um, it's really great to be here discussing autonomous uh, technologies and automated driving. Uh, I've been in the industry for a while, and I have to say this is truly one of the most exciting times I've witnessed. Um, uh, this technology can do for the driver what the, uh, what the Prius has done for the industry. It's, it's really game changing. So, Toyota has been in the car business for over 75 years of life, and about 55 years here in the U.S. Uh, last year, we sold over 9 million vehicles globally, and about uh, a little over 2 million here in the States. Um, today, though, I would like to expand a little bit on, on uh, what defines Toyota. Uh, we do more than make great cars. Uh, we aim to provide transportation solutions. We're designing and building cars. Our customers need for today, and we're also researching how those needs will change in the future. In fact, we invest about $1 million per hour in research and development. Areas: hybrids, 
alternative fuels, collaborative safety research, home energy management, new user experiences, connected vehicles, intelligent transportation systems, and of course, automated autonomous technologies. So the term autonomous vehicle carries with it many different uh, varying viewpoints and definitions. Uh, it's been called driverless, uh, self-driving, autonomous, robocar, uh, Michael Knight, I mean you name it, there's uh, a lot of people attached to their own versions to it. <laughs> Uh, at Toyota, we refer to it as automated and believe in a future where the driver is ultimately in control. Where the technology serves as an always attentive uh, virtual co-pilot that adds to the skill of the driver. It's similar in approach to autopilot on an airplane, uh, where the pilot has the ability to interact and override uh, functions such as takeoff and landing. Uh, these automated technologies will greatly uh, aid in our goal of eliminating traffic uh, accidents and fatalities there's over 30,000, Rob mentioned 30,000 uh, traffic fatalities each year. Uh, to put it into perspective, uh, that's like Juneau, Alaska disappearing. Uh, well, that's, that's, that's pretty significant to ask. Uh, we believe in a thoughtful, layered introduction of safety systems that are constant improvement and increased integration are key components to achieving this goal. So, the question we have to get is, are these systems available today? Uh, yes, in fact, many are in the building blocks of the automated vehicle of the future. So, 10 years ago, we introduced our uh, groundbreaking millimeter wave uh, radar-based pre-collision system. Uh, we continue to enhance it with each new generation. In November, we launched the all-new uh, 2013 Lexus LS uh, that offers the latest version and is now the most advanced pre-collision system on market. Uh, it helps the driver to avoid or mitigate collisions uh, with vehicles or pedestrians under a number of different situations, uh, you know, whether it's city speed or freeway speed, uh, day or night. Uh, if the system anticipates a collision, it sounds a warning and a break. Brake alert is eliminated. Uh, if this, the, uh, excuse me, simultaneously, our system activates several cooperative systems uh, to increase steering quickness, suspension control, and brake effectiveness. And ultimately, it'll stop the vehicle that sees the uh, situation as being broken. Uh, it's augmented by four additional automated features. First, our upgraded lane keeping assistance uh, that can respond to road crown and crosswinds. And it actually, uh, notice on the slide there, it actually looks at the lane markers on the road. Uh, our blind spot monitor helps to identify vehicles in the uh, Driver's blind spot at even lower speeds, rear cross traffic alert, uh, detects uh, rear cross traffic when backing up, and adaptive cruise control uh, is capable of operating between speeds of 0 to 125 miles an hour. Now, all that said, if you put all of these systems together, you're almost there. These are just some of the advancements we've made in the last decade. So, looking toward the future, we're testing advanced safety systems and automated technologies at two research centers half a world apart, one in Ann Arbor, Michigan, the other one in Japan, at Higashi Fuji. Our Ann Arbor facility is known as TRINA, or Toyota Research Institute North America. Um, there, we're actively testing what some call our autonomous car, we call it our Advanced Active Safety Research Vehicle, uh, which we showed off at uh, CES this past January. It's outfitted with a number of advanced uh, systems, including uh, forward and side facing radar, high definition stereo cameras, uh, advanced GPS, uh, 360 degree LiDAR, uh, inertial measurement units, and rotary encoders. Uh, using this vehicle, we're able to really thoroughly test out uh, you know, the future platforms for autonomous. And take a look, it's, it's, it's quite a looker, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, maybe not ready for production yet, but anyways. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, the advanced systems on our 2013 LS that's on the road today uh, started out looking similar to this. Um, as an automotive manufacturer, it's part of our responsibility to continuously refine the hardware and software to such a degree that we can uh, integrate it into the vehicle in a way that maintains the vehicle's style and aerodynamics while also engineering a solution that will be accepted by the market at a price point customers are willing to pay. Um, according to JD Power, this is interesting, um, I feel a study last year. Uh, a fully automated solution, uh, customers are willing to pay up to $3,000 for it. So what we're showing you here today, uh, that's about three or four times the cost of the car. So also, uh, from a research standpoint in Japan, uh, we've uh, faithfully replicated an urban environment uh, in Higashi Fuji. We call it our Intelligent Transport System, or ITS Proving Grounds. 
It's uh, a whopping 375,000 square feet in total and is equipped with uh, digital short range communication uh, devices. Uh, we're testing different forms of uh, vehicle to vehicle, uh, vehicle to infrastructure, and uh, uh, pedestrian detection systems using the uh, 5 gigahertz spectrum that's been allocated uh, in Japan uh, for this type of necessary, reliable, uh, and safe communications. Uh, this type of communication will help us find ways to help reduce accidents involving pedestrians and other vehicles and intersections with poor visibility uh, through the continuous exchange of secure data uh, at short range and is also an important part of many conditionally automated features. So what I mean by that is some of the automated features that we're looking at for the future uh, may not be able to be fully uh, realized without systems like digital short range communication. Also with Higashi Fuji, uh, we have the world's largest driving system. Uh, we use to gather realistic data on how drivers respond to uh, different situations when they're behind the wheel, such as if they're tired or uh, distracted or, as Rob said, if they're stupid. Um, so, technically, yeah. yeah. We can fix two of them. <laughs> so, uh, this facility is absolutely huge, uh, and we're testing real people in real situations without the real consequences. So, I've talked a lot about technology so far. Uh, it's definitely a core part of the automated driving system. Uh, the technology issues aren't completely solved yet, but they're fairly mature. Uh, it's our task next to uh, really improve the efficiency, reliability, and drive out costs. Uh, there are also two other dimensions that I'd like to talk about, and society and regulatory. So from a society standpoint, uh, it's all about uh, trust and getting drivers to a point uh, where they feel the automated uh, technologies can perform tasks that they've been doing for a while and do them well. The advanced psychic safety research field we showed off at the uh, Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. Uh, when we had it up on stage, we had a great opportunity to get feedback from our customers about what they thought. And uh, quite honestly, the feelings were arranged. Um, it started out as, uh, I don't like driving, I'll buy this today, to, I'm a great driver, uh, don't you dare take away my control. So there's certainly a little bit of work we have to do in that uh, But we can do it together and uh, help it explain and, and uh, demonstrate how, how safety systems can be. The regulatory side, though, is perhaps much more interesting to me. Uh, there's a lot of debate about the uh, legality of automated driving and the surrounding liability uh, questions and issues. Uh, for example, if an automated vehicle goes through a stoplight, uh, who's responsible? So, you know, it goes through a red light and gets the ticket. I really think this generally comes down to a uh, question of uh, identifying who the driver is. So, is it the person behind the wheel? Is it the person who owns the vehicle? Uh, what if the vehicle is completely unattended and it's driving by itself, there's no one in the car? So who's the driver then? So these are the kinds of questions that will lead to a great deal of discussion. In the end, we'll all need to work together to come to common terms and understand to develop standard uh, protocols for testing and evaluation for systems to ensure you're continuing to build trust with the customers. It's not the fun, where are the opportunities? Um, as I said in the beginning, this is game changing. Uh, the safety implications are enormous. Uh, for Toyota, this is a dominating reason automated driving needs to be successful. The chance to save more and more lives each day is our call to action. This technology will also help in the automotive industry into a new era where new business models begin to take shape. These new business models could be in the form of next generation car sharing, fractionalized vehicle ownership, new auto insurance models, the new forms of connecting vehicles and user experience. We're also likely to see reductions in traffic congestion and fuel consumption. Automated technology can really help us make better use of our existing roadway by synchronizing vehicle flow and enabling things like high speed platooning. Uh, instead of uh, the start and stop uh, that we see today, uh, we could uh, see a more thoughtful procession of vehicles. <coughs> These reductions could free up the average consumer spending as well. Today, our drivers pay nationally about an average of $818 per year in what I like to call a congestion penalty. So that's the additional cost they have to pay for fuel just because they're stuck in traffic. Uh, by the way, in DC, um, you score off the charts, it's uh, almost $1,400 per year. Sort of person. So the question is, <laughs> yes, yeah, well, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> so I guess the question for me is, what if this money was freed up? What other industries might be stimulated? So where are the opportunities there? It's really, really high. So there are many other benefits I haven't mentioned. Uh, this is a big industry, and this has the potential to bring a big change in opportunity. 
there are also many questions we haven't asked yet. In fact, we don't know what all, all the questions really are or what they will be. Uh, there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be done before these solutions can be brought to market. So we must work together to find ways to thoughtfully and speedily uh, clear the way for the introduction of automated driving technologies. So thank you for your time. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to someone I uh, respect and admire. Great. Uh, for folks in the back, there's lots of seats right up here, and uh, so feel free to just come on up. Uh, if you're on at the end, if you, maybe you can just move in. Chris. Well, thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. And Toyota is obviously fairly respected in the industry for the work that they're doing on uh, active safety for, uh, for many years. My name is Chris Erbson. I'm the, the, the lead for the self driving car program at Google. We've been working in this space for about four years. I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the history of that, a little bit about what we've done, a little bit about where we see this going and the value of this technology. So the idea of self-driving vehicles or automated vehicles is not new. This is a picture from a Boys Life magazine from 1956 brought to you by American Power Company. Uh, the idea is we would have these wonderful vehicles with fins and bubbles, and we all play dominoes driving down the road as we follow varied cables in the road. Uh, and this is a, a wonderful vision, right? It captures the essence of safety, it captures the essence of freeing people's time, but the technology wasn't ready, and it's always been kind of 20 years from ready. <coughs> in 2003, uh, the Defense Department looked at the problem of self-driving vehicles in the context of trying to save our young men and women's lives overseas. They said they, they issued a statement that we would uh, try and have a third of all U.S. ground vehicles unmanned by 2015. This was, again, a lot of the goal. Um, unfortunately, the National Academy of Sciences looked at this and said that the rate of progress we're making with the technology is just not going to happen. So the Defense Department said, okay, well, let's come up with some new way of thinking about the problem. How do we make this go quicker? And they came up with this concept of the Grand Challenge. And the work I'm going to talk to, uh, I talk about here, and in fact, much of the work in the industry on automated driving and fully self-driving vehicles kind of stemmed from that. It was this kind of woodstock for robot geeks, if you would, where we all kind of got together, we focused on one problem for a while, generated a lot of energy, and out of that energy is flows the notion that it's actually plausible to get self-driving vehicles in the near term. So in 2000, uh, after this really successful program we thought that we actually have to drive uh, 150 miles across the desert with nobody in the, in the vehicles, no remote control. We had people driving, uh, our vehicles driving in the city, 60 miles interacting with other traffic uh, on this uh, mosque military uh, base uh, with no, no negative interactions really. Uh, really compelling days. Uh, we then tried to take it to industry and make progress and uh, it didn't get the traction back in 2007 or 2009 that we might have hoped for. So Google said, well, actually, we think there is real promise in this technology. And we can see ways this can improve people's lives and make them better. And let's take a stab at trying to do this. And so I came to Google, and we, we recruited people from within Google and within the industry to come join us to try and do something new and innovative. Why do we care? Well, it turns out, you know, Contrast ratio on the slide is not clear. Um, but, but safety is a starting point. So it turns out in the U.S., as, as both speakers before me have said, there's an incredible number of people killed and injured in accidents every year in the U.S. on a transportation system. If you think of uh, inventing the car today, right, imagine we had this conversation. We're going to solve transportation in America. It's going to be really great, uh, but it's going to cost you 35,000 people every year to implement. Right, that would be a, a no-go to start with. So now we have the opportunity to go back and uh, revisit some of the assumptions we baked into the technology and try and make it better. We can eliminate about 4 million accidents per year in the U.S. 1.5 million people worldwide are killed each day. Uh, bigger problems, and what, what leads to the safety is the fact that people don't actually respect driving anymore. They don't enjoy it most of the time. If you have your sports car and you're winding up the coastal roads in California, that's a wonderful experience. Uh, commuting to work in D.C., in San Francisco, is miserable. Anyone who tells you they actually enjoy driving in those situations should probably be locked up. <laughs> uh, and this is, this is what people are doing, and, it, and it's becoming recognized both uh, in our call to action to address it, distracted driving from a policy and legislative point of view, but also in the automotive industry and, and, and broader uh, uh, industry. This is Alan Pop, he was former vice president of General Motors. For some, driving is the distraction. For this young lady, it certainly is. 
Um, this is a real picture. Um, this is on the 101 in the in traffic, driving with a trumpet. I think about airbag deployments. <laughs> so, this, is, this is a disaster waiting to happen. When you think about uh, other broader problems, right, um, as we said about carrying capacity of our transportation infrastructure, uh, we're exceeding the transportation capacity we have, right? We're putting more road, more vehicles on the road so faster than the rate at which we're building roads, and that's a real problem. That leads to congestion. The problem is there isn't anywhere to put the roads, and we don't have the money to build more of them. If uh, the number that you quoted, I heard it was 8%, but 6% in that ballpark is the, the, uh, the, if you took a satellite photo of our roads at maximum throughput, right? Not when they're packed as tightly as can be, but when we're getting the most people down the road as quickly as possible. It turns out that the cars would cover between six and eight percent of the surface of the road area, right? That's 94 percent of our road is empty when we're pushing people through it as quickly as possible. So if we can just get the cars slightly closer together, we can dramatically improve the throughput again with no more dollars spent. And in the process, we make people's lives better. Imagine getting to work in the morning and instead of being wound up from the last hour you spent, your last half hour you spent hating the guy in front of you from cutting you off, you got to work in the morning and you caught up on your email, you have read that book you enjoyed in the morning, or you just had a nap, right? Right? Any of those things would make your life better, make our society better, it would just make everyone happier uh, and more productive. So what have we done about it? Well, in 2009, we started a program to uh, test vehicles uh, in California. This was a fleet of, a fleet of Priuses that we used. We tested them on the freeway. We took them out onto some of the winding, rounding mountain roads. Uh, we, of course, also tested with real traffic. Uh, we would test them day and night. So here again, run up the hills. These vehicles are equipped with sensing that allows them to see comparable or better to a person. Uh, they can see traffic lights. They can see pedestrians in the road and understand where they're going. They can see vehicles as they move around us. And unlike people who are kind of limited to look in one direction, they're actually seeing 360 degrees around them. They can drive precisely enough to go through toll booths on the freeway. And they're careful enough to drive in mixed traffic in a complicated urban environments. So here we are at a resort town south of uh, San Francisco. People are stepping into the road, stopping. This is Lombard Street. Uh, <laughs> I tell you, the stupidest pedestrians in the world. Right, the car driving down the road, they step into it, you know, it, it's fun. Um, and this is a very town, challenging situation. Construction, zip and merge, stop and go, whose turn is it? Waiting to find, to get into that. And then here, because of construction, this is foreshortened merge onto the freeway again. So this is a, a nice set of kind of examples, right? It's basically anecdotes that show that the technology has possibility. Um, here we are in a parking lot, making sure it actually handles reasonably. And for a Prius, it's, it's really impressive. Um, <laughs> I think we've probably put more traction control time on a Prius than most people have um, in parking lots. Um, so, so what we have now is kind of an existence proof that the technology can work. And at this point, we've driven over a half million miles, which is basically to the moon and back and then a little bit more on uh, public roads in the US. So there's a lot of technology that goes into it. But what's really important when we try to get this to people is that it's simple, right? Because if, if you need a PhD or several PhDs to operate the vehicle, if you don't understand that it's safe, if you can't interact with it, if it doesn't make your life better, then we're not going to accept the technology. There's lots of optional safety features that are available for vehicles today that are not accepted at the rate we all want to realize the true safety potential because the customer doesn't see the value in it. And this is where we think that fully, uh, more fully automated vehicles, more self-driving capable vehicles will save the day. So here in our vehicles, there's an on and off button, simple, easy to use, there's a display that gives the user the confidence that the vehicle understands what's going on it, on with the vehicle, and in time, we'll get to the point where the user can actually do other things in the vehicle safely, and that will be how how we get them to accept it and bring, the societal, uh, bring society along with the technology. So progress today, just some quick statistics, half a million miles, uh, freeways and surface streets, and so far we've driven uh, between what we call critical interventions, which is when our software thinks that it's working well um, and driving on the road, we've got to about 96,000 miles between it making a driving mistake, which is about 10 years of human driving. It's not good enough yet, 
you know, we need to be thoughtful about the point at which this technology is ready to be deployed and that it's uh, meeting or exceeding human capability, but it's not too bad either. Uh, it's still in the development. I want to show you a, another quick video here. Do you mind if we get the sound for this one? And the goal here is to kind of highlight the, uh, what we see as the real promise of this technology. stop sign. You know, cars using the radars and laser to, to check and make sure there's nothing coming in their way. But why would I sell them? Old habits die hard, man. They, they, they don't die. Hey, anybody up for a taco? Yeah, yeah. What do you want to do today, Steve? I'm on all for tacos with myself. All right, well, let's go get a taco. Drive through. Yeah, they're turning into the party. If I had a self-driving car, Taco Bell would be the first one. I've got one. Now I've got my wallet right here. You can roll down your window and order a burrito. Just like that. You're doing very well. How are you today? This is some of the best driving I've ever done. <laughs> change my life is to give me the independence and the flexibility to go the places I both want to go and need to go when I need to do those things. Obviously, an aspirational video. You got places to go. Uh, um, so, so this was actually all the footage you saw there was real vehicle driving on real roads with real traffic. Right? Uh, we had an engineer sat next to him in the car to make sure that it was done safely. Uh, we had the support of the local police department, uh, but it was this is what the technology promise holds. Right? is that we can actually take people that have been displaced in society and they have been in a way. Steve takes two to three hours to commute to work in the morning because he has to wait for trans special transit or he has to beg a ride from his friends or family. And it really, you know, it can be a piece of the, uh, to, to an incredible degree. We're all going to at some point lose the privilege of driving and having the flexibility to kind of get to see our grandchildren at that point, to get around town just to go to the grocery store will be a big deal. We think this is uh, an important part of where the technology will go. So uh, this is this is my uh, seven-year-old son, Colin. Um, and this is kind of my, my timeline, right? I look at the technology that we have and the potential of it, and I look at the situation in the world with transportation, uh, and I say that you know when he gets to the point of being on these roads and driving, I want him to be safer, and I want him to have a better life. Um, as we talked before, 20 years ago, ITS was a, a you know, a big deal. Self-driving vehicles were shown driving on um, highways uh, around San Diego. Really pretty amazing accomplishments. And at that point we said the technology is 20 years out. And anytime you say a technology is 20 years out, basically it can surf that way, right? Something can be 20 years out forever, <laughs> um, right? It's always 20 years out because you don't have to do anything. And so at Google, we're working hard to actually bring that horizon in and bring it more to like a five-year horizon, and we think that's feasible, and we'll, we'll see where it goes. And we look forward to working with everyone to address uh, the challenges that, that lay ahead of us. So, thank you.
Thank you, Chris. Uh, Bill, again, folks in the back, there are a couple of seats up here. Feel free to come on up if you want. Sure. So, uh, I'm, I'm Bill Krennic from, from the Tech Centuries in Dallas. And uh, first of all, Rob, thanks for remembering our conversation four or five years ago. I, I really appreciate that, and, and uh, thank you for including Texas Instruments in the talk today. Also, thanks so much for the cherry blossoms. So that was really a very nice touch. My, my wife and I were down around the title basin last night, and it was really just spectacular. So uh, let's go to the first slide. I think, uh, you know, uh, Jason and Chris are, are a tough act to follow. Oh, do I have this thing here? I guess I do. Um, and really brought up a lot of the, the key things uh, about autonomous vehicles. Uh, I think, you know, I, I don't really think I can add a whole lot more with this first slide. Just maybe a couple of, of more personal things that I might mention. Uh, this first one, I guess I hadn't really thought about it. As Chris mentioned, you know, if we were talking about cars today, and we said it's going to cost you 35,000 lives a year to have cars on the road, I mean, did that technology have any chance at all? Just the vehicles we have on the road today. Um, and I was also thinking about my sons a few years ago, knowing that this technology was out there. I, my sons are college age right now. And uh, so they did their first lone drives about, you know, seven, eight years ago. And, and you're always very nervous, you know, to think that, you know, you're going to send your child out that you've spent, you know, so much time and got so much emotion with. Uh, and they're going to be out there on the roads and, you know, someone might cut them off or something might happen that they're not quite ready for. And sort of having a, you know, autonomous guardian angel looking over them and helping them out of those situations, uh, bringing them home safely to you. That, that would have been you know, worth a tremendous amount. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Jason mentioned, uh, you know, there have been some studies on the value of these technologies and what people would really pay for them. I think if you're a parent who has a child going out on the road for the first time, and you put yourself in that mindset, suddenly this technology becomes worth a lot more than just a few thousand dollars to you. Um, another one, uh, it's, it's actually very personal. Uh, um, and I think Jason and Chris both talked about, you know, aging drivers uh, um, and what happens as we get older, reaction time and our ability to see deteriorates and in our, in our, our life deteriorates. Uh, my mom, now I'm from southern Minnesota, I grew up on a small farm near a small place called Lesur. If you read the, the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, that's kind of the area that I'm from. And uh, my mom right now as we're speaking is probably sitting in her chair uh, watching uh, a game show. And she's been doing that for probably about the last 10 years uh, because she hasn't been able to drive. And even an autonomous system that could take her down the road a few miles to her friend's house. And if it only worked on bright sunny days um, and only worked out on the country roads where there's really nothing to steer around anyway, uh, it would have made just an overwhelming improvement in her quality of life over the last 10 years. And so uh, when we think about these things very personally, we suddenly realize this really has a tremendous value. Um, I actually believe that uh, the people uh, in those situations, and, and, and at the end of the day we all are, uh, would realize that uh, this technology is, is for many people worth more than the car is because the car without the autonomous capability to someone like my mom can only sit in the garage. She's got to get someone to drive it for her before it can take her anywhere. Um, the last point uh, was touched on just a little bit. Um, again, I grew up uh, driving tractors on my dad's farm. And so I was driving uh, at a time when I was terrified. Uh, uh, my father had me on the tractor and it took my entire body weight just to push the clutch in to stop the thing. Um, and I've always thought of myself as a pretty good driver, uh, having survived that, you know, you're kind of ready for anything. Uh, but driving on, uh, you know, Minnesota roads in the wintertime, it's icy and that kind of thing, you build up a confidence and a capability to drive. And I enjoy driving. And I think, I think we should all learn to drive and it's important. Uh, I think to the people that uh, think that this isn't going to be cool, and I have a lot of friends that drive uh, sports cars, it's like, wow, can you imagine autopilot? This is just going to be the coolest thing. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Tesla taught us that a lot of these technologies that we don't think belong in sports cars, like electric technology, actually can find their place there and be quite exciting. And I think autonomous uh, transportation, uh, we might actually find out that some of the first cars on the road uh, might be, uh, this, this is Bill Frank's prediction alone, might be some pretty exciting vehicles to drive. With that, let me tell you a little bit about Texas Instruments. Uh, many of you might have had a Texas Instruments calculator in high school or college. Uh, that's actually a very small part of our business. We're very proud of it, but, but it's uh, less than 5% of our revenue. We're really a semiconductor components company. Texas Instruments invented the integrated circuits, and Jack Kilby, the inventor, actually received the Nobel Prize for that. So we're very much into components. We're in a lot of systems. 
Um, we've got a focus on safety at TI. Our CEO has identified safety as one of those things that's important to society and that the corporation should focus on preferentially. And so Safe TI is actually about more than just uh, automotive safety. It includes medical products, uh, aviation products, and, and security products, those kinds of things. But we have had a very strong drive on automotive over the last many years. We're the world's largest supplier of integrated circuits for advanced braking systems. So uh, when you're out on the slippery roads and the ABS system keeps you from getting the car in front of you, it may well be a Texas Instruments integrated circuit that's, that's helping that happen along. And I've included a couple of dive photos. Uh, some of you, uh, uh, you know, at Texas Instruments, these are like our baby photos, right? We, uh, make, we're really proud of these little uh, uh, photolithographically defined chips, uh, and we wanted to share those with you. Uh, but we do provide uh, semiconductor component technology and sensor technology for really a wide range of, of automotive use, uh, computer vision systems uh, uh, against advanced braking systems, uh, stability control systems, traction control systems, those kinds of things, uh, uh, electric power steering systems, uh, and the like. And so uh, we're quite, uh, uh, we're there very much at the component level. Uh, I think uh, Chris and Jason talked more about the system level and the entire car with the sensors on it. We're actually the people making those sensors and those subcomponent technologies. Uh, we're very much involved in ISO 26262, a functional safety standard. In fact, we lead the semiconductor activity on that standards body. Um, it's very important when we talk about these systems that, that we think about what it really means to have, for example, a system failure. Uh, you can imagine, uh, you know, if, if we have a, uh, let, let's say it's a lighting system or, or a heating and ventilating system in a building. Uh, the system can simply say, well, hey, I've, I've detected a failure. I'm going to just safely shut down, and, and it's your problem, and get someone in to fix it, right? Uh, you can't do that for a car barreling down the road at 70 miles an hour. You can't just say, hey, uh, it's, it's over for me, and you take over. Um, you've got to be able to detect failures uh, very early on. You've got to fail in what we call a functional way, an operational uh, failure so that the system continues to operate and brings at least the, the, the present use of the system to a successful close. Uh, we've seen some of this, and some of you are probably familiar in aircraft systems, multiple redundant systems operating to try to, uh, to ensure that if there is a failure, the chances of there being some kind of catastrophic result is very, very small. Uh, some of our newest uh, uh, semiconductor processors that are used in automotive and other systems run well over 100 real-time continuous diagnostics. So while they're operating, they're running literally hundreds of diagnostics in real time continuously to detect fail and make sure that the system, if it does fail, comes to a successful close. And as you might well imagine, even though we, we oftentimes think of these large robotic systems as complete systems that have to operate that from a high level, we can sense failures and we can detect the onset of failure at the component level before it's apparent at the system level. So we can bring something very unique there. Another aspect of Texas Instruments, I just want to note it very quickly on the slide, uh, we're involved in a lot of other stuff. Almost anything you pick up that's electronic that you own probably has a TI chip in it of some kind. And so as we talk about entertainment systems for cars, information systems, some of the things that we'll, we'll roll out alongside autonomous transportation, because as the driver can take their attention away from driving the car as a full-time activity, they can do things like put on their makeup and dry their hair and play their porn and their computer synthesizer. We're involved in some of that stuff too. <laughs> Okay, um, so just a few thoughts. Um, there's a lot of change here. Uh, I talked a few times already about the family farm. Uh, when my dad was a young boy, he actually uh, uh, mowed hay and plowed the fields with horses. And, uh, and so in his lifetime, um, going from you know, horses to internal combustion engines was a big change. Uh, it could well be that the change we see with autonomous transportation will be just as dramatic, maybe even more so, as we go from you know, simple cars that we steer down the road to cars that can do some of those or all of those functions for us. Uh, it's going to evolve over quite a few years. Um, there's going to be some challenges. There's going to be some bumps in the road as we go along. Uh, we've got to keep the big picture in mind. Um, I tried to keep all the problems, kind of the big problems that people throw up, to just one bullet in my presentation here. Um, and I won't dwell on it for very long. But yes, there are issues with malware. Yes, you have to worry about hacking. Uh, you don't want to create a system that allows someone to hack into it and, and bring all of Washington, D.C. to a standstill. Um, those things can be overcome. Uh, product liability, I think Jason mentioned very briefly. Uh, yes, that is a big challenge. Uh, who's at fault? Uh, who owes who what at the end of the day? Um, 
I'm not an expert on policy, but I have absolute confidence that if we can save tens of thousands of lives, that we'll fix all of those problems. I think as a society, I can't imagine with, with our humanity at our base, that we wouldn't uh, find a way through those things with the incredible benefits that we can gain from the technology. Um, it's going to be an exciting ride. It's going to be a lot of fun as we go through this transition. It's going to take some time and there will be some challenges. Uh, there's a lot of benefits. The leaders are going to benefit the most. That's always the case with new technologies. Uh, the United States is leading. Uh, we're not the only country working on this. Other people understand it as well. Jason showed uh, uh, test tracks in Japan. But uh, we are a leader and we can exploit that. We can benefit our society with that. Uh, but we've got to have the courage to stand up and bring the technology forward. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I want to thank you very much for inviting me to participate uh, in this. I am Mary Che, and I am on the Council of the District of Columbia. The district is an odd jurisdiction. We are not a state, but we function on the council as a leg state legislature, a county government, and a local government all rolled into one. So um, it's a lot of fun over there. Um, I want to say a couple of things, uh, you know, in my role as a member of the council and the uh, head of the transportation uh, committee, but before I do, just uh, I want to make an observation about the race of technology. Just last night I was at an event, uh, it was a, a medical society event, but there was someone from NIH talking about the Genome Project. They never expected by 2003 to map the complete genome of a human body, um, but by collaboration and by almost a race and competition, uh, they were able to do that by 2003. But then the question is, well, what happens after that? What can you do with that? There was speculation by futurists that, well, gee, we would hope that in 20 years we would be able to, in uh, one day, and at a cost of $1,000, give each of you uh, your, uh, your genetic makeup that you could then take to your doctor and, and, and use it in various ways. Uh, they were saying 20 years. Here it is 2013. And they're already at a place where uh, in one to three days they can get your uh, genetic uh, makeup and uh, at a cost uh, not much more than $1,000. So uh, what happens is, and it's not just in that area, but in this area as well, we talk about 20 years. I think that what happens is you get a critical mass, you get the competition, the collaboration, and then you leapfrog over what you thought would be the, the time period. So I'm very uh, optimistic that we're going to be uh, closer uh, to where we think we would have been uh, as this uh, gels and, and moves forward. Um, second, I just want to make an observation about the taxis in the District of Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> I did uh, pass this law, a, a significant uh, omnibus statute to, to bring them into the 21st century. However, implementation has proved to be quite difficult. And uh, I've had oversight hearing after oversight hearing, and we are not there yet. So if you happen to get into a taxi in the District of Columbia and you're grievously disappointed, we're the ones who have to make the leapfrog to take from legislation to actual implementation. But I hope you get it a good one in the meantime. Um, in December, uh, the council passed, and it was uh, unanimous, uh, the bill that I authored, it was called the Autonomous Vehicle Act, and it allows autonomous vehicles to operate legally here in the District of Columbia. And in that sense, we followed other states, California, although we are not a state, um, <laughs> California, Florida, and Nevada enacting, in enacting this type of uh, legislation. And we were the first urban jurisdiction, uh, really, to, uh, uh, to take this on uh, in, in our region. Now, we do have uh, the technology, and it will be moving forward, uh, but I believe that we have to have established the legal framework within which these vehicles can operate. So that's why we wanted to jump out and, and do exactly that. Um, this is part of an overall approach to transportation. Transportation is the lifeblood of any community. If you can't move, can't work, can't have a social life, can't do all the things that we need to do. So, I don't know, maybe it was uh, Jason or so someone said something about we look for transportation solutions. That's what we're doing in the District of Columbia. First of all, in the district, we have almost 40% of the people, sorry, who don't even own a car. <laughs> and many of those who do own a car are what we call car light. They only have one. What, what are our people doing? Well, we have uh, 
bike paths, we have cycle tracks, we have bike share. We have 28,000 members of, of, of our bike share program. So if you're not a member, you should join. You can go out to the stations, get your bike, travel all around, return it wherever you are, and, and, and go on your way. We've been embracing uh, car to go, fabulous system, zip car. We have uh, uh, focused heavily on engineering our way to extraordinary safety for our pedestrians so that people feel very comfortable and safe in walking. We have uh, buses, we have subways, and very soon we will have uh, streetcars operating in the District of Columbia. So we have all of this and we regard it as a system and the taxis are part of that. But this is also part of that because we know what, has, what is happening in, in the district and in the region. It's not just the district, it's the region. People coming in from Virginia, people coming in from Maryland. Two-thirds of the people who work here don't live here. So it's a massive influx and then exodus uh, during work days. Now, in terms of the, uh, the approach uh, that we're taking uh, you know, with respect to traffic, first of all, one of the problems someone brings, well, what are we going to do if an automated vehicle you know, uh, runs a red light? We have that solved in the District of Columbia. We have photo enforcement, and we do that really well. And it's the owner of the vehicle who pays the ticket, unless that person can prove that somebody else was driving or there's some other explanation, the car was stolen, you have to pay. So that, 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 that's not going to be a problem. We got that, we got that covered. Um, but in terms of uh, thinking about this, choking on traffic, about one-third of the congestion in the District of Columbia right now one third of it uh, is uh, people who are looking for parking spaces. They're circulating round and round and round looking for parking spaces. So we have to try to figure that out. Now, we're not to the autonomous vehicle yet, but one of the things we're doing, we have various uh, policies that we're trying to implement, performance parking. We'll raise the cost of parking on the street uh, to match whatever the demand is so that there's constant ch uh, turnover. But the answer to this, if it is ever autonomous vehicles, will be extraordinary for that congestion problem. Just that one third alone. Just that one third, because you, you could get out of your car and say, go park. <laughs> you know, that would be wonderful. And my, my uh, you know, I'm probably way older than most of you here. Um, my reference is the Jetsons, <laughs> which even if you didn't see it in the original, as I did, you could see it on Nick at Night, right? These, these cars that would operate, well, we're, we're almost there. Now, um, as others have said, the other thing for congestion, it would increase the capacity of our roads. Because if you have vehicles moving in a way that shrinks the space between them and allows them to move efficiently, it would be an extraordinary uh, uh, you know, reduction in, in the congestion that we have. Um, not to mention, which should be at the top of the list, but I, I was talking about congestion, the safety factor. And you have heard all of the statistics about how many uh, accidents are caused by uh, people uh, who are driving, uh, distracted drivers of, of all sorts. Um, we could increase productivity, which we're always interested in doing, of each and every one of us. Because the car drive, although you might be in uh, pretty Minnesota, but if you're in the District of Columbia and you're, you know, you've seen the monuments, okay, fine. But you have a lot of email. You have a lot of email. Well, you can do it in the car on the way on the way to work, or you can read that book. Um, and of course, people who are disabled, the extraordinary possibilities for people who are disabled to be able to just move around, whether it's from age or other forms of disability, um, we uh, we want to see that happen and be available for our, our residents. Now, in terms of the legislation we passed. Um, we have a provision in there that, that some were disappointed that we put in there, but apparently uh, the law says that in order to drive one of these vehicles on the roads in the District of Columbia, you have to have a driver, a licensed driver, behind the wheel. Somebody who could take over in the event of some problem. Now, does that somehow uh, diminish uh, the, the prospects here? Yes, it does. So, so for example, if someone were blind, they couldn't get a driver's license. Uh, they'd have to have somebody else uh, uh, do that. But we feel that we want to move uh, somewhat conservatively until we have, you know, uh, assurance that these vehicles can operate and operate uh, safely in an urban jurisdiction. Now, I was lucky. I went in a Google uh, car and uh, with a, another council member 
and just like those people who were depicted uh, in that uh, frame there, uh, we, we decided to sit in the back, because I figured if there was an accident, I'd be <laughs> but uh, I told the person in the front, I said, I want you to raise your hands, you know, because I'm are you tricking me here? Um, and you know, so we're driving down the road, and I was wondering what the people in the lane next to us were thinking. <laughs> um, but it was a fabulous uh, experience, and, and Luke <coughs> brought the, the prototype here, and uh, I was extraordinarily impressed, extraordinarily impressed with, with how it operated. Um, you know, there, there will be lots of other issues uh, that will arise, and we'll have to tweak our uh, legislative construct, probably. Um, one of the things that we had to deal with, you know, to, to uh, satisfy some concerns, we had to talk about uh, vehicles that were <coughs> altered to become autonomous vehicles and to put right in the law that the manufacturer of the vehicle that was later altered to become autonomous would not be liable if that vehicle then uh, had a, a, an accident that was caused by the conversion to being autonomous. You know, the, the manufacturer wanted to, to be held harmless in that way. And there are, you know, there are other issues uh, that obviously are going to, to come up in terms of creating this construct. But we are interested in any and all advances to in, improve our transportation system and transportation solutions. And this will be a key one. And I, I just can't wait until we can actually uh, put this on the road and, and see people in these cars. Uh, thank you. Thank you, that's great. So um, we will end at no later than 1.30, and so we'll have plenty of time here for questions. But I just want to make one point, and that's, um, you know, to me, the really great thing about the U.S. innovation system compared to other regions like Europe is Europe really embraces what's called the precautionary principle, which is, you know, let's get it all right, let's make sure there's no possible harm, and then we'll go forward. What we embrace is the sort of one step forward, do a little testing, fix a problem, take another step forward, do a little fixing, take the problem. And that's really what the council was talking about. But when we get kind of here, let's create a framework that lets that happen, and let's see what happens. And you know, there are going to be problems, we'll figure these things out as we go along. And I think that is exactly the right approach, uh, which is partly why I think we may lead in this, because we're willing to take these risks. And you know, it's not going to be perfect. There will probably will be a mistake somewhere along the way. Uh, but the net benefit will be so overwhelming that we'll say, okay, well, we fixed that mistake, we learned, we're going to go forward, and the rest of the world, after we've done it and figured it out, they'll just copy us and we'll have, done, we'll have gotten the first mover advantage. Um, so with that, I just want to open it up. If you have questions or comments, if you want to just identify yourself, and I'll go right here here. So, yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, Richard Bishop, Bishop Consulting. I'm an intel I mean, a, a consultant at the Intelligent Media Center. Um, <clears throat> question, I guess, mainly for Jason and Chris, is the possibility of certifying these systems in some way, performing certification. Should that be done by the individual company, self-certification? Should it be done in an industry-wide way? Or should the government come in with some performance specifications to enable these things to come to market? You have, you have more experience than I do. Uh, so, thank you. So, um, that's a, a fair question. I think uh, it's, it's, it's a blend of all of the above. I think um, the, just like most vehicle uh, safety systems, there needs to be some sort of uh, standardized guideline for performance. Um, so, I think that we work together with uh, NHTSA and the like to figure out what those specifications are going to be. So, it's, I don't think anyone necessarily has all of the answers. I think as we uh, look toward an autonomous future, we're going to be, or an automated future, there will be opportunities to release uh, products along that cycle. So there will be a good opportunity to start to build standards for each one of those products and, and, and get good in certification with that Yeah, and I think my take is very similar to, to Jason's in that right now there, there is a process for this. There's rulemaking and the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration comes up with these things. Uh, and then the auto manufacturers self-certify that they're meeting those standards and then periodically they're, they're evaluated. And I think that, that feels like the right way to do it. Uh, back here and then, and then right here. Terrence Lamb, senior economist at uh, GO. <clears throat> One reason I have actually two questions. <coughs> Regarding the uh, speakers, you know, throughout your presentation and your discussions alluded to the liability issues. And if you have a chance to recommend to, to Nisa or whoever that are listening, what 
would you kind of recommend that uh, some of the changes or, or you know the, the uh, what should be done in order to bring to to, to bring about the invitation of all this autonomous driving? Because you, you mentioned my life did it. The second one is how does the autonomous driving fit into the overall pictures of of the connected driving? You know, you're talking about vehicle to vehicle and vehicle infrastructure. How does it fit into the big pictures of this? Because you don't just want you know the car driving by itself, but they also want to connect and talk, communicate with the infrastructures and all the also to the vehicles on the road. So how does that, you know, fit into the pictures of that? Do you want to take the back to question? So um, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking um, what are the regulatory issues or recommendations? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it, this is a pretty broad topic. So um, I think really the, the upfront answer is going to be working together and, you know, maybe Mary has having gone through this would be a good, a good person to, to you know, talk from a, you know, a regular standpoint. Um, as far as the um, the communication systems are concerned, you know, digital short range communication and vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure and pedestrians and the like, um, I think there's a, a quite a bit of um, interesting opportunity there. Um, when we start to look at that, though, you know, we need to make sure that the communication is reliable, it's secure, it's private. Um, once uh, you think about a world when all the vehicles are talking to one another, uh, that's really exciting because the, the potential for the vehicles to share learning and share experiences and that, it's, it really opens up the door for another form of uh, you know, advanced communication and really safety in that regard. Um, so you know, we look forward to discussions about um, looking at uh, you know, spectrum analysis to figure out where those, uh, those things need to be and, and have really good thoughtful conversations about um, how we're going to make sure that this is you know, safe and allocated and you know, we're doing the right thing for our customers. Do you want to? Yeah. Do you mind if I offer that one? So just about the liability issue. Um, so people talk a lot about it because it's it's an easy question to ask, right? So what happens when, when a self-driving car does something wrong on the road? And it turns out we have a very robust legal system in America today, right? <laughs> um, it, turns out, you know, it turns out what's going to happen no matter what the law says is uh, in, in the near term is, you know, People are going to get sued, and we're going to resolve it. We're going to discuss the facts of the case, and then something's going to come out of that. And so, I don't think there is actually a anything that precludes the vehicle and technology today. I think that though, and, and furthermore, we, we don't really know enough yet about the actual value of the technology to society. Right? We can speculate. We we have lots of models of how it will be useful. I'm one of the huge proponents of the technology, right? Um, but until we actually see it realized in the world, and we realize that value for society, um, we don't know how to appropriately protect it. Right? And, and if you look at models of, in the past of how this has been done, for example, the airline industry and the airline manufa aircraft manufacturers, right? when the... Sorry, I don't know what that means. Um, I'm going to continue sitting here until I see you all run from the room. Um, um, uh, is that you know there wasn't a protection for the first you know for the Wright brothers when they when they made their first plane right? they made them they went out there and they had value and society eventually realized the value of this and it's put in place protection for the manufacturers of the airlines and then when we get to that point we can have the discussion but right now it, it's not a barrier to entry there's things we could do to make it to make it uh, to make it now, yeah I'll, I'll be on that yeah. um, so that that's the thought on, on liability. And then on the connected vehicle, these, these are two technologies because they're advancing in parallel right now that, that often get intertwined, right? There's the self-driving capability and the connected vehicle capability. And they're almost orthogonal, right? So you can have, you know, we have cars that people get in today and drive, right? And we can have cars that talk to one another. Um, and both of these are two really exciting technologies that in the future will come together and perhaps, you know, you, you can imagine a self-driving vehicle uh, that has superpowers because it now talks to other cars, right? It can't use its sensors to see through buildings, but by using the connected vehicle network, it can see a vehicle coming down a road that it wouldn't otherwise be able to. Right? So there's ways we can augment each other, uh, each of these technologies, but they're, they're not fundamentally connected. Just, just to add a couple of points. Um, with regard to liability, um, I think Chris articulated it well. I mean, that'll all get sorted out. But keep in mind, uh, when cars learn from each other um, and, and also learn from the mistakes that they make, I think Chris mentioned that the Google car now makes like one mistake in 10 years of driving, right? 
Uh, the cool thing about that is, is you find out that, okay, it did make a mistake. There was a situation that no one had foreseen. The car made a mistake. Now you can fix that in software, and it doesn't have to happen again, right? Uh, unfortunately, with human drivers, we all make the same mistakes over and over again, right? Uh, and if I make a mistake driving to work tomorrow, the rest of you can't learn from that, right? And so I think there is something there that's, that's an underlying intelligence and improvement that uh, it just makes things uh, get a whole lot better. And, and I think with regard to, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the capability of an autonomous vehicle, um, I think very soon, and probably before we see widespread deployment, we're going to see that these vehicles are not only very good drivers, but actually better than a human driver can be, because you've got things like VUI and V2V, uh, radar, sonar, uh, computer vision systems, LIDAR, that are all working together. Um, the vehicle can look in all directions at all times. It can talk to vehicles that, that as human drivers we can't even see. Um, so I think uh, uh, as the technology rolls out and we see overwhelmingly how very, very good it is, there will still be a liability issue, that's for sure. Um, but I think uh, overwhelmingly the, the, the technology will seen as having value. And as I mentioned, I think, I think those issues will be, will be worked out in time. You know, my vehicle talks to other vehicles all the time, it's called the horn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit, uh, little bit uh, antagonizing. Yeah, so did you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I just want to make a, an observation about uh, the legal regime. Um, I, I'm also a, I'm a long-time law professor at uh, George Washington University, and although I don't teach torts, um, uh, I teach constitutional law and criminal procedure, I'm quite well aware of these other uh, topics, and our uh, tort law is sufficiently flexible to respond to the new kinds of shapes of problems that, that will arise. And just by way of an example, when I was talking about uh, the assurance to manufacturers about vehicles that may have been converted to an autonomous vehicle, the language in Section 4 says, um, the original manufacturer of a vehicle converted by a third party into an autonomous vehicle shall not be liable in any action resulting from a vehicle defect caused by the conversion of the vehicle or by equipment installed by the converter unless the alleged defect was present in the vehicle as originally manufactured. Now, we probably could have gotten away with not even putting that in, but that's a kind of an assurance if, if manufacturers want to feel that they are protected. Because what you're doing is you're trying to identify the cause of the of the of the uh, of the defect, and that was true way way back when we had original harms with vehicles. A long time ago, there were major cases that had to be decided about uh, products that were produced, and then people used them in a certain way. Well, was it the product defect or was it the use? There are all of these trails of doctrine but they are flexible enough to respond to the problems that we, we may encounter with autonomous vehicles. So I, I don't see that as a problem. And as I said, even this legislation, as we move forward, there may be uh, uh, tweaks that we need or changes that we, and we're, we're ready to go and, and we, will, we will respond as needed. But in general, the legal regime is, is adequate to, to respond to this technology. Great, thank you. I'm gonna go in the order I saw them, so up here and then, uh, and then there. I, I, um, my name is Dick Mudge. I'm a card-carrying economist, uh, and I'm interested in the, in the economics of networks, which means I'm interested in, uh, in, in economic productivity at a macro level, which means I'm interested in access to labor, access to jobs, access to markets, which means I'm interested in, in transportation reliability and, and, and traffic congestion, which means I'm interested in headway. So my question is, how low can we go? Um, what, what's a practical limit in terms of that will be safe uh, uh, for, for, for uh, uh, vehicle headway? An inch? How close can you back up? Yeah. Uh, I, I, so it's a very <laughs> complicated answer, so I'm going to give you the, the soundbite answers. Uh, so um, in Europe, they've been doing studies with uh, vehicles, road platooning here, and there I think they're keeping two meter kind of separation. It turns out for collisions, you know, actually touching one another is kind of nice because you, you don't have a delta V when they collide, but that's practically very hard, if not possible. So a couple of meters seems what's at least plausible. Uh, the problem there is you get grit thrown up off the road and you get that go again, you have to redesign the vehicle so that you don't block up the radiator and other problems. So 
I don't know. They, it, it's a hard engineering problem to answer exactly how tightly, but from a control system point of view, you know, sub meters probably plausible. That's pretty much the distance now when you drive on the New Jersey turn. Yeah, I echo a lot of what uh, Chris said. I think. Um, you know, that's, it's a really exciting opportunity to take better advantage of the uh, infrastructure we have today. Um, I, as I said earlier, too, I think the uh, some form of short-range communication between the vehicles becomes very important also. So, you know, how are those vehicles going to talk to one another? You know, there's proposals of you know, using uh, short-range communication. There's talk of using uh, some sort of uh, light emitting. You know, there's, there are many opportunities to do this. Um, but I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. You know, looking for ways to consistently interface with each other is going to be, you know, really critical as those systems get developed and built out. Uh, my name is Amitai Dinana from the Office of Senator Kuskund. Um, first of all, it's really exciting to see the private sector be so involved in driving this forward and taking it towards commercialization. I was wondering if you could speak about the role of other governments, maybe more technocratic governments like China and Japan that we've heard have been involved in these technologies. What is their role? Do you know anything about their roles in promoting these technologies? And is there anything you can learn from that about the any potential role? <coughs> you obviously know what Japan is. Sure. So, great question. Um, so, Japan's very active in the space uh, from a research standpoint, looking at intelligent transportation systems. I mentioned earlier that we're using uh, digital short range communication in Japan. We're actually uh, doing multi frequency tests. So, uh, in Japan, we're using the VHF frequency as well as the 5 gigahertz band that we talked about here. Um, you know, it's interesting. So from Japan's standpoint, the, uh, the population challenge that we have today of the aging population is actually um, somewhat magnified there. So uh, Japan's um, position is it's, it's a, a very you know, realistic tactical problem that has to be solved to um, help manage, uh, you know, that, again, that aging population. Here in the U.S. we have uh, something like 10,000 folks turn 65 each day. So it's, it's you know, along the same, a little bit worse in Japan. Um, so going back to the video that Chris showed about, you know, handling the disabilities and whatnot, it's, uh, you know, again, it's something I said, you know, we're very passionate about. So, uh, um, you know, our researchers are working very heavily in Japan to uh, solve this problem. In fact, there's, uh, they're even taking it a step further, um, given um, the infrastructure of Japan is a little bit smaller to deal with. There's, they're actually doing some tests with, uh, on the road with, um, uh, you know, light emitting and things like that to manage stoplights and manage flow. So it's, uh, from a government standpoint, there's a great relationship that we have in Japan to, to help foster these things. Uh, I think uh, right here. Uh, I'm Matt Warner at New Broadband Policy at the FCC. Um, I was actually wondering to the extent uh, 3G and 4G networks would be utilized by these cars, you know, besides like maybe just mapping the middle of the destination, you know, what other ways, uh, if they're, you know, that's part of the consideration. You go first this time. I'll go first this time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so our vehicles today use the 3G or 4G network. Um, so the, when, when we talked earlier about connected vehicles, uh, there's a lot of work in a, uh, on a dedicated short range of digital communication network, DSRC, which is outside those bands. And that is intended to provide very high frequency updates. The, the 3G and 4G network are incredibly valuable uh, for just providing lower uh, uh, data that we can uh, live with larger latency. Uh, they're still very fast networks. We can get a couple of seconds kind of uh, update rates uh, and latency. And that's, you know, we, we ship map data, we ship um, information that says which roads are uh, open or closed for the vehicles to operate on. And, you know, uh, it's, it's incredibly useful and we'll continue to be. So I, I would echo that, yeah. The, I, think, I think when you, when you talk about vehicles going down the road, um, you know, merging together in traffic, uh, coming apart at high speed, You've got to be able to make and break communication links very quickly. You've got to be able to do that very robustly, and you've got to make sure that uh, you know that you've got uh, uh, infrastructure and the protocol of those networks to make sure that, that you've got sound communications and and there's no uh, you know presence of someone creating mischief, no malware or hacking or anything like that going on. I think with regard to uh, 3G and 4G, I would echo what Chris said. Uh, those are, are, are those networks were not designed with that in mind. And so trying to, to do vehicle to vehicle through, say, 4G LTE, that's not really practical. I think you need the, the DSRC for that. But, uh, but certainly for uh, um, navigation purposes, for updates on road conditions, congestion, uh, optimum mapping, um, you know, where there are threats on the roads, that kind of thing, uh, um, certainly the network can be exploited for that, along with, of course, infotainment. 
raised the point before, and, and I, I'm just curious how this would be resolved. Your autonomous vehicle comes to uh, a construction site, and someone said, some uh, slide there, uh, who goes first if you have to merge or whatever? So how does that get communicated? How would you know that? So you can take this one. I can take this one. Uh, yeah. So, so we the one with the Toyota. That's that's red to Toyota. It clearly goes first. Uh, so, uh, take Jason's answer for him. Uh, so really, it, you know, it, it turns out that we, you know, people do this every day, right? We we get into these zipper merges, and there's some kind of subtle interaction about the positioning of the vehicle, and I'm slightly in front of you, therefore I should be a whole car length in front of you, or whatnot. And um, we have actually developed algorithms that, you know, based on experience in these situations, react in kind of a similar manner. Uh, and ours are slightly more cautious than probably most DC drivers about this, and a little less aggressive, but they, you know, it, it's a matter of uh, you know, studying the, the human driving habits because uh, these vehicles are going to interact with, with human driven vehicles on the road. Even if you have that stupid driver that we keep referring to? <laughs> that, those, those are the challenging ones, yes. <laughs> Uh, we'll go here. Actually, I'm sorry. If I could add something. Just oh, okay, good. Uh, one comment about the 3G, 4G. I, I think the so as others, others have said, I think it's really important to focus on what is the application. So if it's a safety application, then we need to look at the spectrum that's going to best deliver on that. If it's an uh, infotainment function, then you know that's slightly different. Um, with regard to vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, and, and pedestrian detection systems, that's safety. So we have to you know be very careful about making sure that that communication is reliable and secure and safe. Um, but I, I think looking forward to, um, you know, let's look at the theoretical future of the, the fully automated vehicle where I kind of sit back and, you know, just kind of read a book or drink a coffee. Um, that, I think that's going to shift the relationship of driving in a way. And what I mean by that is, what am I going to do with that time? And am I going to need to leverage, you know, an LTE, you know, sort of connectivity to stream content to the car? This really fundamentally changes the, the way that we look at the vehicle experience. I mean, I'm, I'll need access to a, a, a ton more of, of, of other you know, opportunities and information and things like that if I'm going to use that time for other uh, collaborative or you know, sort of business or offline purposes. So I think uh, looking at the car as a uh, connected vehicle, um, we've talked about it for years, but I think in the next 10 years it's going to become an even more dominant player in looking at what we like to call the fifth screen. Your windshield could be a video uh, Skype uh, experience. Uh, Maybe just one yeah. additional comment. You know, Mary raised the, the thing about you know when we emerge, and, and you know, obviously we're, we're all many times in a hurry. But if you're doing other things in the car, if, if you're not just driving, and you're not having to deal with with driving, and, and your only objective is to get you know out of the driving and wherever you want to go as fast as you possibly can, it lowers the stakes. You know, if you're if you're able to read a book or browse the internet or talk to a friend. Uh, that kind of thing while you're driving, uh, it becomes a little bit less important that you you know cut ahead of the guy and, and you win the, the the battle of who gets to, to merge in front, right? Uh, Philip Weber, Congressional Budget Office. Let me sound a skeptical note. My GPS has not gone 10 years or 100,000 miles <laughs> without screwing up. My PC in my office, well, not mine, but the person in the cubicle. This morning, the PC, which is a lot less than 10 years old, gave her the blue screen of death. Um, so when I keep hearing about this, and the PC industry has certainly had 40 years of cumulative learning that we, we were talking about. So realistically, uh, that one metric sounded very nice, but realistically, how much PhD mechanic time have you had to maintain your cars? Um, what did it, you know? Do you have an IT department for each car? Um, just realistically, what does it look like? So, so that that number is uh, what we call release software and release vehicles, right? So, so that you we we have a kind of a structured process by which we push software out the door for testing on the roads, and it's not released in that you know, give to the general public, but it's you know, it's software that we've kind of hit a, a metric or, or some milestone and then uh, run through a variety of tests and then release for, for broader testing. Um, that number, you know, there are things that go wrong, right? And this is, the, the software is running hundreds of diagnostics a second to check to see if everything's happy. Right? This is, the 
the, in the state where it thinks things are happy, right, where the you know, wheels haven't fallen off or whatever else might go wrong with your car, that doesn't happen very often, it turns out, um, uh, that, you know, while it was driving, that's how long it was between, you know, it making driving mistakes. The rate at which uh, it detects something that's unhappy, and these are, we, we set the bar for this uh, incredibly low. Right, the, the, how, how quickly it says that something's not quite right is about 250 to 300 miles right now. And we're focusing on the smarts of driving rather than the hardening at this point. And so that's why I talked about that other metric, because the second part of that metric is, is, is good old kind of engineering and, and just putting in the time. And, it, and it's a lot of work, and, it's, and you shouldn't underestimate the, the challenge of doing that. But it, it's different than in, in adding the smarts in the vehicle. Just to talk about the PC industry and kind of software reliability, right? It, it's a very different space. It turns out that it's okay if your PC reboots once every week or even once a day, right? It kind of pisses you off, uh, and you're really annoyed that you didn't save the thing. Uh, but but you know, no one gets hurt, right? And so the incentives in the in the way that the software is developed are quite different than the incentives in developing software to, to drive a vehicle, and that's why you see. You know mismatches, and so you're right. Your your Garmin screws up, and your 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 Windows box, you know, reboots. Um, but comparing that in the 40 years of lineage that has versus the the automotive industry, where you know I don't know how many lines of code are in a Toyota vehicle, but it's millions, tens of millions probably. Uh, and it turns out you turn your car and it goes most days, and when it doesn't, it's something mechanical that's probably failed. So. Well, isn't that part of it though? Like, like my refrigerator, I never reboot that. That has all these electronics. In it. It's partly because if you're integrating the machine in, into the machine more, and it's more of a single-purpose device, whereas a computer is a multi-purpose device. So, I mean, is that am I off on that? No, no. I, I think it's I think it's a good point. Uh, I also wanted to mention uh, uh, one of the when I was thinking about this technology some years ago, I actually had an office uh, in our in our building that was out by 635 LBJ Expressway in Dallas, which some of you might know is one of the major thoroughfares. And I was trying to figure out, you know, how often is it okay for me as an individual, you know, societal acceptance, forget about technology, to just shut down the highway, to have an accident and screw up and shut the whole thing down. And I thought, you know, I should get to do that once in my lifetime at least, right? <laughs> and so I took a quick poll and I looked at the number of cars going by and I figured, okay, well, you know, if everybody got to do this once in their entire lifetime of driving, how much would the highway be shut down? And what's amazing is you find out human drivers are really, really good. You know, we tend to think of human drivers as being really, really bad. Um, but the truth is, it's amazing. If everyone shuts down the highway once in their lifetime, the whole system is shut down all the time. And it isn't. It would be totally unusable. So, and I'd recommend, if you, if you live by a thoroughfare, you have the chance, or you can get your hands on some numbers, do the computation. You'll be amazed at how good human drivers are. But you know what? They're just not good enough. And the reason we don't have, you know, people figuring out our taxes and writing our paychecks by hand is because computers do it a whole lot better than we do, right? I mean, there are things that computers just do dramatically better than we do. And the stakes are so high now with, uh, you know, the cause of pollution, the, the impact of congestion, the cost of car accidents, the cost of, of injuries, the, the, the associated uh, deaths and, and serious injuries that occur, that I think we really have to realize that it's, it's gone beyond our ability. Uh, in spite of the fact that human drivers have now been trained for a long time, and again, they really are very, very good. Uh, you find that they're just not good enough. And as a society, we're going to have to turn the corner. So I apologize. I think we only have time for one more question. I'm going to get in the order. It was somewhat over here. So why don't we go here? And then if you have, uh, if it's quick and we have a quick answer, I will go to you because I've seen your hand up. Oh, my God. Um, Hillary Zarin, fellow working in the Office of Transportation and Air Quality at EPA. Um, wondering if you guys can comment a little bit about the, um, any kind of systematic data collection you might be doing on particularly Toyota on these vehicles with GHG emissions? Uh, so, it, thank you, it's a fair question. So with regard to um, environmental data collection, oh, sorry. Um, for the autonomous vehicles, it's uh, it's not currently focused, but it's on the plan to uh, to evaluate because it's definitely a thing that we see as a significant impact. Um, but, uh, you know, that's looking at Toyota as a whole, there are many other uh, Ways, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at uh, you know, working on alternative fuels and uh, actively studying car sharing and a lot of other things. So it's um, the autonomous program that I'm really working on is not a uh, core function yet, um, but uh, certainly will be in the future. 
And then we get the last question. Uh, I'm Patrick Roberts, Virginia Tech. Are any of you working on uh, autonomous aerial systems, and are those part of the transit networks of the future? Aerial systems. Drones? Drones? Uh, well, yeah, also called drones, or various uh, unmanned aerial units. I don't know how to fly it. <laughs> <laughs> I know you Google it, but it's a secret project. Drones. <laughs> I have one of those little helicopters, but... Uh... <laughs> we, we, we actually do have a, 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 an informal privacy working group that meets every month, and uh, we had a, 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 a second last one was on drones, and uh, there is a house bill being introduced, or being considered, I should say, on drones and drone privacy, which is quite interesting. Um, it's a congressman from Massachusetts on that point, and a subcommittee chairman, maybe anybody can Well, I mean, just an interesting issue. Yeah, it's an interesting issue. I mean, it's, there is some, some cross benefit to automated technology, it's you know, part of the same idea, but you know, if you look at ways to reduce congestion on uh, freeways, automated driving is one of those ways to do it. Um, transportation, you know, long haul and short haul, whatever, it's, it's, that's certainly a lot of congestion factor too. So um, using some sort, of, some sort of aerial vehicle to do product delivery could certainly be a, a, you know, a cross benefit to this, this technology sector. You know, one thing we didn't talk about at all uh, was uh, long haul trucking. And uh, you can imagine that at some point in the future, if this is good enough, we could get dramatic improvements. I, mean, I, I, I would not want to be a truck driver. I think it would be an incredibly difficult job. You're away from your family. You're doing something incredibly stressful. If we could automate those jobs, it's like a big improvement in the lives and productivity. Um, so with that, um, I want to stop. But I also want to commend you. If you haven't seen the, the report we just issued today, uh, my colleague Daniel Castro and I have drafted it. The road ahead, the emerging policy debates for IT and vehicles. There should be copies out there. If there aren't, you can just get those on our website. Uh, also, if you want to watch this again, because you really think this is fascinating, you can watch it tomorrow on ITIF.org uh, or to share with the colleagues. But I want to uh, please join me in thanking. I thought it was just a fantastic, fantastic panel. Uh, and I appreciate people coming from out of town, as well as our local colleagues. And uh, again, please join me in thanking them.